Welcome to Arcane the Brewcast. I'm Jamie, your Arcane Brewer. And I'm Jake, your Arcane Engineer. Thank you to Mom Rock for use of their song Conversation in our intro. We heard your feedback about the last episode. This one's going to be much shorter. We're going to get straight to the point. Today we're doing king cake and brown sugar. Let's go. King cake is a dessert that in America is associated with the holiday Mardi Gras, a Christian feast holiday celebrated preceding the 30 day fasting period of Lent. I'm always down for a good feasting holiday, especially one with beads and booze and an exclusive style of cake. So a king cake is sort of like a coffee cake with a cinnamony filling in the middle, sometimes more like a braided cinnamon roll dough thing in a bunt pan, with filling in the middle and icing on top. The filling in the middle differs from recipe to recipe, but the most recurring ingredients I've found are brown sugar, cinnamon, raisins, and praline pecans. The icing on top might be cream cheese frosting or royal icing. Wait, royal icing? Like, with the queen beads? No, that's royal jelly. Uh, royal icing is made with meringue, like egg whites uh, whipped with, uh, with uh, sugar, and uh, vanilla extract. Is royal jelly fermentable? Royal jelly's a little bit fermentable. It has less sugar than honey, but you can ferment it. Okay. I think there's something there. There might be something We'll, we'll circle back. Royal jelly's kind of expensive, but we will circle back to that. The cakes are topped with sprinkles in the colors green, purple, and gold. Green for faith, purple for justice, and gold for power. And finally, after the cake is baked, a little plastic uh, baby is hidden inside the cake. And you want to do this after the cake's baked, otherwise you'll have a little melted baby in your cake. Yes. The little baby represents the baby Jesus, and it's supposed to bring luck to whoever founds it. Uh, a tradition derived from the Roman holiday Saturnalia. To make our king cake, we're going to use the following ingredients. One cinnamon stick per gallon. 15 ounces of rich, flavorful brown sugar per gallon, 2 ounces of homemade pecan pralines per gallon, 2 ounces of raisins per gallon, and finally, 1 pound of wildflower honey per gallon. So you didn't mention which frosting we'd be using. Are we going to be using the cream cheese or the royal icing? I know which one I want to use. Uh... It's the royal one. Neither. Neither? Neither. I don't want to put cream well, excessive cream, or eggs in our meat. So instead, once fermentation is done, um, and if the meat still tastes like it would be a good fit, I'm gonna blend this meat with a little bit of a sherry meat that I've made in the past and have on hand. A sherry meat is a meat that's been allowed to undergo a period of controlled oxidation, bringing out mildly creamy, brown sugary, sort of nutty flavors, similar to Apollo Cortado sherry. I've used it before to upgrade a vanilla nutmeg mead into an eggnog mead, so I think it'll be a good fit for what we're looking for here. I'm going to be using wildflower honey because it's what I have on hand, but if one wanted to tweak this recipe a little bit, a mesquite or avocado honey might also be a good fit, since they have a flavor that skews a little closer to molasses. Um, you might even include a small portion of buckwheat honey, which is very dark and has an earthy, toffee and molasses-like flavor. Buckwheat honey is very strong in flavor, and some people don't love it, so keep that in mind. Treat it like you would a spice. But what I have on hand right now is regular wildflower honey, so I'm just going to use that and rely on the brown sugars to add some complexity. So, we need to pick out some brown sugars. But what is brown sugar? The most common form of sucrose available commercially is, of course, granulated white sugar, which is mostly pure sucrose. But that's not the way we find sucrose in nature. We're going to focus on cane sugars today. How do we start with this and end up with this? Start with raw sugar cane and break it up into chunks called billets. Those chunks then go into a mill that really fucks its shit up. You have this macerated sugar cane pulp, an enzyme called invertase is added, 
to help break down the sucrose into fructose and glucose. Monosaccharides. Monosaccharides. They're more water soluble than sucrose is, so they will dissolve into the water better, making it easier to separate them from the other impurities that are being removed. Later, they will uh, recombine into sucrose and form crystals. So once you've extracted the juice from the sugar cane, you're gonna wanna purify that by removing impurities, that's stupid. This uh, sugar cane juice is then boiled down in large vats until it thickens and turns into a concentrated syrup. This syrup's gonna darken because there's a little bit of caramelization happening, but also all the minerals in the syrup are concentrating. I thought it was caramelization. When this concentrated solution is heated, it's able to have more sugars dissolved into it. When you cool it, those sugars come out of suspension and form crystals. They'll often add already processed sugar to the vat in order to act as seed crystals for it. At this point you have a mixture of syrup and crystallized sugar. Next we take that and put it into a centrifuge where the liquid is removed from the crystallized sugar. That liquid is molasses. For some brown sugars, a portion of this molasses is then added back to the crystallized sugar to create light or dark brown sugar. Some of the molasses can be boiled down again to extract more sugar and create a darker form of molasses afterwards. Okay. Um, like blackstrap molasses. Like blackstrap molasses. This process produces a lot of different sugars along the way. Uh, depending on where you stop the process, you could turn the masket into an unrefined sugar like jaggery or muscovado. Or you could uh, filter it or refine it with a centrifuge and make turbinado or demerara. Or proceed to the very end, refine it to white sugar, and turn it into light and dark brown sugar. We'll explore all of these in a minute. Let's start with the unrefined sugars. The sugars that are made by concentrating the cane juice, but then not removing the molasses by any means. These sugars are called panela in Colombia, or piloncillo in Mexico, which means little pylon for the cone shape it's sometimes molded into. Panela and piloncillo can also be formed into loaves, blocks, or discs. Piloncillo can be moist and crumbly, but the stuff we found was as hard as a rock. Jaggery is an unrefined sugar from India, made from sugar cane or sometimes date palm sap. Jaggery tends to be darker than piloncillo and has a sharply nutty, smoky, molassesy, and frankly, sort of weird flavor. Finally, muscovado. Muscovado has a strong molasses and toffee flavor with a smoky aftertaste, but isn't quite as intense and pungent as jaggery. It's darker than dark brown sugar, but other than that, it looks a lot like it. Muscovado contains about 8 to 10% molasses. Demerara and turbinado are partially refined, which means they're centrifuged to remove some molasses, but not filtered to remove all color. Demerara has a pale amber color and a pleasant toffee or butterscotch flavor. Demerara granules are very large and relatively dry and can be substituted for white sugar. The word Demerara comes from a colony where it was once produced. Demerara contains about 1-2% to molasses. Turbinado also could be substituted for white sugar. Otherwise very similar in flavor, with less caramel and a slight hint of more molasses. Turbinado is made from the first pressing of sugar cane juice. The word turbinado comes from the Spanish word turbina for the centrifuges that spin it. It contains about 2% molasses. Finally, the refined sugars. White sugar has had all color filtered out and removed from it. Then, molasses is added back to create light brown sugar and dark brown sugar. Light brown sugar has about 3.5% molasses. It's usually a little darker than demerara and turbinado, but it's much more moist with much smaller grains. Dark brown sugar has about the same fine grains as light brown sugar, but contains about 6.5% molasses. We're going to be making some praline pecans to go into the mead. Um, and for that, we need a one-to-one -one ratio of uh, white sugar, to, uh, to brown sugar. But what that really means is like a dry, like granulated sugar to a like kind of moist, finer grain sugar. And we can substitute any ones we want. So we're gonna pick which ones we like. We've got just regular white table sugar. 
sucrose in its mostly chemically pure state after it's been subjected to all that stuff we talked about. Then we have right here demerara sugar and turbinado sugar. And they look extremely similar. Al almost identical, pretty much. I feel like this has slightly larger grains than this one, but uh, by, I agree with that. Barely perceivable, but yeah. Um, yeah. These are usually within like a one percent uh, range of uh, molasses content of each other, so it makes sense that they'd be very, very similar. But uh, just so it had a shot at it, let's try the uh, the white sugar. Remind ourselves. What white sugar? I think we have every day tastes like. Pretty boring. Yeah, pretty boring. Just sweet, stripped of everything else. Sweet still isn't bad, but pretty boring. So here we have Demerara sugar. Significantly larger uh, granules than in the um, in the white sugar. I, I'd say the largest of the of the three. Also got some real crunch into them. Mm. Definitely a little more complexity. Yeah, definitely. Really tasty, actually. A uh, um, delicious toffee flavor. Yeah. There. Yeah. Let's try the turbinado. Slightly more moist than this. Not as, not as interesting though. Yeah, I think I agree. Mm. It, it tastes more like brown sugar as as we're used to it. Gonna go back in for a little more demerara. Really should have prepared a palate cleanser. So for fermentation, we're going to be using whatever very dark, moist brown sugar we like best. But for the pregnolines, we need one that's granulated. And I think the demerara is the one we like best. Oh yeah. Of the granulated sugars. So now let's try all the others. There's a lot more. All right, so now we're going to compare our, uh, our moist brown sugars, um, which we need a one-to-one -one ratio with for the others. We have here uh, Panela, Piloncio, which these are kind of the same thing, uh, Muscovado, Jaggery, and also off-camera light brown sugar and dark brown sugar. Um, starting with Panela, so, all uh, four of these are unrefined sugars uh, that have not been put through a, a centrifuge and still have whatever molasses that resulted from the early parts of the production. Yeah. Uh, now, panela and piloncio are essentially the same thing. Um, the main distinction is that uh, panela comes from Colombia and piloncio from, um, from Mexico and, you know, shapes they're in. But these will still be different, so we might as well see which one we like better. Uh, the piloncio is a, or the panela is a little more moist. Very moist, like the frosting almost. Yeah, it really is. Um, this is a little bit harder. It's probably just oxidized more during uh, production, but um, it was kind of hard to shave off of the uh, pylon. The flavors, I feel like slightly more molassesy mm -hmm. than this one. But I think I still liked this one more. I would agree with that. Um, moving on to Muscovado. And this one looks visibly different. Most of all, it looks like um, light brown sugar and dark brown sugar, like you'd get in a supermarket, except darker than dark brown sugar. Much more molasses -y than either of these. Kind of smoky. Yeah, not just smoky, but reminds me of cigars. Yeah. Like a kind of tobacco-y flavor to it. Yeah, I kind of get that. Like, kind of like walking, not like smoking a cigar, really, but like yeah. walking into a cigar shop, that smell. Yes. Yeah. I taste that in the Muscovado. I and like it's, that. It's delicious. And then finally, the Jaggery. Um, stuff's a little pungent. Just a sharp, intense molasses. But 
There's also some, kind of something stinky in there. I don't like it. There's kind of something, like, kind of sulfury, but is jaggery not sulfur treated, right? I don't know. I wouldn't think so. It's weird. I kind of like it, but... Nice. I think that's definitely the least appealing of the four we've had. We're trying to pick our top three. So, I think if we're trying to reach a consensus, it's clear that there's one we have to eliminate right now. Yeah. Jaggery. Get rid of Jaggery. Yeah, we don't need that. Although, I'll definitely brew with it at some point. But, um, next, we have light brown sugar. Just regular light brown sugar. Domino. Like you would get at a, at the supermarket. Shores. Very clean, moist, a kind of mm, caramel. Yeah. A lot better than I was expecting it to be. Yeah, like I was expecting it to be plain compared to all the ones uh, we've tasted, but tasted. But um, takeaway is that uh, light brown sugar is pretty good. Um, I'm not sure where it is in these three, so we'll, ha we'll have to go back and is forth. Is this the dark brown? There's the dark brown sugar. And this this is 3.5% uh, molasses. This is 6.5% molasses added back to a uh, refined granulated white sugar. The dark seems creamier. Like, it, it dissolves on my tongue very quickly. I think that's because it has that slightly... A greater moisture content yeah than the uh, light brown I'm finding this a surprisingly more difficult decision than I thought because um, I really like the kind of like soft caramel flavor that the light brown has um, but I also have to consider um, what's going to still be there after fermentation I so we are kind of looking for strong flavors now are we also blending this with regular table sugar this is a 50-50, or is that for the pralines? Uh, so 50-50 will be, yeah, for the pralines, the granulated with uh, with one of these. But we're also going to brew uh, three different versions of these, uh, each with uh, one of our favorite of these brown sugars. Because um, we don't have enough to make a big batch of, of just one. So... Right now, we've got five in play. We kind of have to set, decide who we're removing. I'm putting Muscovado up for being one of the final. Advancing it? I'm uh, advancing it. I agree. Uh, Muscovado is fantastic. I, I really like it, and I definitely want to brew with it. Yeah, let's go back and forth between Pilon and CO. And then I'll compare that to this guy. I think I like the Piloncio more than the light brown sugar. And they're similar enough that I, I would consider that an elimination. Okay. Yeah, you know, between these two, I think I like the Pinello more than the Piloncio. I agree. And I think it makes sense to remove the Piloncio, keep the Pinella, keep the dark brown sugar, keep the Muscovado, ferment with those. All right, so let's uh, start weighing these out and brew with them. Our pralines start with evaporated milk, to which we're adding the demerara sugar and some of the panela, dark brown sugar, and muscovado that we just picked out. Then we add pecans and a tablespoon of butter. One minor issue is that pecans, evaporated milk, and butter all contain oils. You usually don't want oil in a wine if you can possibly avoid it, because it can give an unpleasantly slick mouthfeel or go rancid. And there are alternatives commercially available pecan extracts or butter extracts with no oil that one could add to a finished meat to try and approximate the flavor of praline pecans. We might end up using some of those too, but extracts are added after fermentation, which we aren't filming until later and wouldn't be able to include in this episode. So that wouldn't be very interesting to watch, would it? I'm going to heat up about four gallons of water, so I have a little extra for making PBW and sanitizer. I'm heating this water to boil for sanitation reasons, but you don't need or want the water to be boiling to make mead with it. This will just help sanitize some of the ingredients and dissolve the sugars faster. Now I'm gonna weigh out a pound of wildflower honey each for the first two batches. I don't have quite enough large pots handy for this, so I'm gonna start with the first two batches and then do the other one. 
I'll add 3 quarts of near boiling water now, and top it off later if I need more volume. Next I weigh out 14 ounces each of the brown sugars. We have here our top 3. Muscovado, with a few ounces of Demerara to make up the weight. Vanilla, with just a little peel on CO. And dark brown sugar, with a little turbinado added. I'm also adding these ingredients while the sugar must is still hot. 2 ounces of raisins, 2 ounces of praline pecans, a stick of cinnamon, and a teaspoon of superfood, a yeast nutrient that I have on hand. Next, I chill the must to around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, so it'll be ready for the yeast. While it chills, let's check the gravity on a braggot we've been brewing. While we're waiting for the sugar must to finish cooling, I'm going to check the gravity on a mead I started uh, about a month or so ago. This is the brown sugar Pop-Tart Braggot, uh, made from a whole lot of Pop-Tarts, uh, a fair amount of brown sugar, and some honey too. I'm looking at the gravity here, and it looks like we're sitting at about 101.5, uh, which means this should be about 9.5% or so. Fairly light for uh, for a braggot, but um, you know, not not inappropriate. Uh, we're gonna try it and see what we think of it. All right, so brown sugar uh, pop tart braggot, uh, pretty hazy, but uh, there's no like obvious slickness. I'm not seeing any, uh, like, oil on top. Ooh. I like it, actually. Not bad. I was expecting bad. Yeah, it, so it kind of smells something like, um, like a, I, I've made a malt liquor before, mm. like a strong corn-based, uh... The Le Corde in, Blanc? Yeah, the Le Corde Blanc. Um, with a Pilsner malt, that's kind of what I'm getting out of this. Like, a fair amount of heat, fair amount of booze, but just kind of a pale Pilsnery base. Mm. And what went into this again? So, this had a little bit of brown sugar, um, a fair amount of wildflower honey, and 200 brown sugar Pop-Tarts. Um, which was like a, a ton of boxes we got extra cheap. Uh, there's still some like cloudy bits in it. Um, definitely could stand to uh, Did be filtered. Did we filter? Do much for fining? We didn't do any fining on this yet. We've uh, we've just you know kind of fermented it, and this got this one bubbled for a while actually. I I think it was still breaking down starches and like fermenting them over the past like month or so. Vigorous. Yeah, vigorous, vigorous fermentation, long fermentation. Um, a lot of heat. This could stand to have some age. And I'm, I'm really reaching to find anything brown sugar about it. What brown sugar did we use in this one, now that we know a little bit more about brown sugar? We used dark brown sugar, supermarket, 6.5% molasses. And um, it's good, but having spent all day eating brown sugar and talking about brown sugar and thinking about brown sugar, I'm not getting a ton of brown sugar from this. No. But brown sugar wasn't the largest part of what we fermented. More than anything, it was bread. Um, yeah, Pop-Tarts. Yeah. And I, I guess there's a brown sugar paste inside them, but there's really not that much frosting once you get in there, all, all things considered. It's a thin smear. Anyway. Uh, not bad. So, let's uh, finish cooling the, uh, the the must and find out how much sugar we got. Cheers. Cheers. Despite each getting the same amount of brown sugar by weight, there's some major differences. The Muscovado has a gravity of 1073, the dark brown sugar 1067, and the Pinel of the Lotus at 1061. If these each ferment dry, they might be between 8 and 10%. We're going to aerate the yeast with an oxygen wand, because it's important to have lots of oxygen at the very beginning of fermentation for a healthy yeast. If the headspace looks terrifyingly small, don't worry, we're using blow-off hoses. Finally, we pitch D47 yeast and set the carboys aside in our fermentation room. At this point, everything is basically good to go, except the last ingredient arrives a little later than expected. Jesus Christ, the original boss baby. 
Fermentation is already underway by a few hours by the time they arrive, but as a general rule, I do not back down from holiday-related nonsense, so we're doing this. I sprung for these expensive, extra Jesus-y looking babies because, one, they look more kingly than the other creepy babies, but especially, two, they look like they'd fit through the neck of a one-gallon carboy. The more common ones look a lot more generic, but their freakishly long arms, though probably good for keeping people from choking, would not have fit in my carboys. There's supposed to be just one per cake, but I feel like this mead could use all the divine intervention it can get, so each carboy is going to get its own king baby. Today we learned about brown sugar, how it's made, what makes one different from the others, and what they all taste like. We also made a king cake mead and checked in on our Pop-Tart Braggot. If you'd like to submit any questions to us, you can do so in the comments or by emailing us at info at arcanemeads.com. Subject line, brewcast question. We are Arcane, and our meadery is still coming together, but you can find us at Foolproof Brewing Company every Tuesday, and sometimes other days. We are early on in our development, and every time you share this really helps us out, and we really appreciate it. Thank you to MomRock for use of their song, Conversation. If you recommend us to your friends, have them start at the latest episode. Hopefully we'll only get better with time. Up and to a point. As will, hopefully, this meeting.